Okay, thank you, Maud, and hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar by the NCCHPP. Um, let me introduce us. So we belong to a network of six collaborating centers located across Canada and financed by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, our mandate, our specific mandate, is to support public health actors in their efforts to promote healthy public policies. And, well, later on, I will say a bit more about healthy public policies. So that's me, and I'm assisted today by my colleagues Alize and Maud. So again, if you have any technical difficulties, you can let them know by uh, using the chat box. Also, let us know in case the, the sound is too low. Um, this webinar is accredited by University of Montreal's School of Public Health, so I am obliged to disclose any conflict of, any conflict of interest I may have, and I have known. So, that was about us. Now, let's talk a bit about you. So, please, just to give us an idea of who is out there, please answer this poll. Um, to let us know if any of you are um, are logged in with colleagues today. So I'll just leave a few moments for you to enter your answers. When you registered for this webinar, you answered two questions, and here are the results for the group. So more than half of you indicated that you have an intermediate uh, level of knowledge with respect to uh, today's uh, webinar subject. And the majority of you also have um, some practical experience in the area. So hearing your input will be interesting today. Uh, as you will see, we will hold several interactive activities, including three question periods during the presentation. So I will suggest you to type your questions in the chat box as they come, and I will answer these during Q&A periods. So our goals today are to get you to recognize the distinctive challenges faced when sharing knowledge in policymaking contexts, and also to get you to use a list of questions to reflect on your own practices in this field. So please, you can notice the Colorful Brain logo. Uh, it will signal questions for reflection throughout this presentation. Unfortunately, we won't have time today to discuss these questions, so they are intended as take-home messages. And just a, a word about these uh, webinar's goals. Uh, I like to say that we do not claim to offer magic bullets. Uh, rather, our perspective is to explore the challenges that arise when sharing knowledge to influence policy development in order to try and perform a little better. And to perform better, first of all, we may need to widen our focus. So when thinking of sharing public health knowledge to influence public policy development, our first reflex is to focus on this. So as public health actors, uh, what knowledge strategies, uh, knowledge sharing stat strategies can we use uh, to reach political actors? And it's natural for us to focus on that part of the process because it's the part we have the most control on. But actually, the whole process looks more like this, uh, provided, of course, it continues right to the end, which often is not the case. So. Don't panic. Uh, I will walk you through this figure. Uh, it was developed, uh, well, we drafted an initial version based on our hypothesis, and then we finalized it based on empirical data uh, gathered through a literature review. So the subject of the review was the same as today's webinar, but more precisely, we focused on the process of sharing knowledge. It was a systematic review exploring databases from several disciplines and focusing on empirical data, not theoretical literature, in order to draw practical lessons. And in this process, we have included 92 documents. Uh, a recent publication outlines this figure, but actually it's not the end. It's uh, the beginning of a project because more documents will follow, also based on the literature review and that will explore different aspects in greater depth. 
So, the program for today. We will analyze this figure together, and those who have already read the document will be revisiting its contents, but there will be also more than that today. So, in addition, uh, I will add to that with several insights drawn for the, from the literature. We will also have interaction, and I will conclude uh, by talking about next steps in the project. So, let's clarify what we are talking about. So, so far we've been discussing public health knowledge, but we actually mean scientific knowledge. That said, not that easy. How do we define it? So, I will ask your input here. I would like you to select uh, the, the types of data among these three ones that you recognize as scientific. So, the options are research-based data, expert knowledge uh, acquired during the course of a career, and analyzed data. So, I'll keep the votes coming in for a few moments. All right. So, are you can, as you can see, there is a really a consensus about research-based data. Also, quite a a vast majority of you considering analyzed data as scientific knowledge, and, well, half of you only um, recognizing expert knowledge as well. So, actually, we can uh, solve this pragmati pragmatically. Um, let's see how political actors uh, consider scientific knowledge. Well, they consider uh, all three of the kinds I've just presented, and even more to be scientific knowledge. Indeed, we postulate that if they recognize an actor as scientific, they will also recognize the knowledge he or she puts forth as scientific. You can see the quotation here uh, from a study in Australia. It reveals that political actors have a pretty broad notion of who the experts are. And you may ask, why should we focus on political actors' point of view? Well, the answer is because it's important to see things through the eyes of the people we want to address. So, we've talked about public health knowledge, but uh, political actors also hold relevant knowledge, and that's why I insist here on the word sharing, as a reminder that to produce knowledge that is relevant for a certain context, it helps to listen to what political actors have to say as well. This brings us to the first two questions for reflection. So, first one, what type of knowledge do you wish to share? And the second one, uh, are you trying to collect knowledge from the political actors you are, you are addressing? So, as I said, uh, we will not discuss this now, but you may wish to use these questions later on to reflect on your practices. Now, about the actors, the main actors involved. Uh, we've categorized them um, in political actors. Uh, among them, we think, obviously, of policymakers um, at any level of government. Uh, the, this could be municipal councillors, ministers, members of parliament. We also um, uh, consider uh, the actions of the advisors of policymakers, and by this we refer to the persons who work within government to assist policymakers with the development of public policies. So this is not about here uh, outsiders who give occasional advice. And on the side of public health factors, we, considers, uh, we consider those with scientific legitimacy in the eyes of political actors, which we suggest includes researchers and public health professionals. Now, two comments about public health professionals, because they work in public health organizations, so government organizations. The first thing is that a minority of public health professionals, that is, those who work at developing public policies, are also advisors, according to our definition, but really, it's a minority. And the second comment is that um, as long as you work for government organizations, 
There may be procedures in place that circumscribe what can be done to share knowledge. For instance, uh, there may be restrictions in terms of who is authorized to handle external communications. So it's just a reminder here that if you are a public health professional, you may have to take this into account when choosing knowledge sharing strategies. And the functions uh, I will talk about today, um, it will be a lot about, well, producing knowledge. Just remember that we use here a broad definition of scientific knowledge, including expert advice. And I will talk as well about conveyors of knowledge. Um, that conveyance would be, it could be about uh, conveying knowledge as is or uh, transformed. And of course, the same person may fulfill the two functions. So, we can start with the figure. Um, there could be three points of entry into the process. It may be initiated by public health actors, by political actors, or else take place in the context of collaborations between all these actors. So the question for reflection here is, among which of these three points of entry do your activities for sharing knowledge take place? And your answer here will orient you towards other questions for reflection that apply to your situation. So let's start with the first situation, initiative by producers or conveyors. And here I will ask for your input. Um, so I'd like you to tell us what strategies do you use to share knowledge? Uh, typing your answers in the chat box, please. So I can see some people are starting typing. I will wait for a few moments here. So answers coming in, uh, workshops, policy briefs, publications, conference presentations, webcasts, uh, policy briefs again, yeah, several times, reports, primers, so similar to policy briefs, uh, webinars, the use of knowledge brokers, infographics, that's interesting, uh, developing networks, mm, summaries, yeah, interactive meeting that bring together stakeholders with common interests. Interesting, an exchange uh, of between researchers and those who share their experiences. Okay, thank you for all your contributions. I can see, yeah, new answers, newsletters, social media. That's interesting. Uh, printed resources, GIS mapping. Great. Okay, well, thank you all for your input and for showing the diversity of strategies that exist. Uh, so, some of you mentioned strategies directly aimed at political actors. And another option is to reach them indirectly through mobiliz mobilizing other actors. So, in this regard, public health actors sometimes use the media, which also improves their chances of influencing public opinion. Or public health actors can also partner with NGOs. And in this regard, I invite you to read the second, second quotation here. It's interesting. It shows how uh, Australian re researchers um, keep close relationships with community and practitioner groups because this, they know these groups are stakeholders in consultation processes organized by the government. So a nice example of, of partnership. One must be aware that other actors may also use scientific knowledge in their policy influencing strategies. So these private companies may do that, lobbyists, etc. The, the risk, of course, is that as soon as another actor conveys scientific knowledge, he or she may then, may then transform it to suit a particular purpose. The determining factor here, uh, for now, the aim is just to reach political actors. So uh, it's about the relevance of the strategy. And for better outcomes, conveying knowledge through their usual information sources is advisable. 
So as well, for recap here, the questions for reflection. Have you analyzed the information sources used by the actors you wish to reach? If you are a public health professional, are you subject to specific procedures? And if you've worked with the media or with NGOs, what were the advantages and disadvantages you saw in doing so? So now, the second point of entry. Uh, when political actors perceive a need for scientific knowledge, they engage in strategies to seek uh, this knowledge, either in the form of objects, such as documents, recordings, etc. But more often, actually, they seek knowledge from people, as, ex as exemplified in these two quotations. Um, mostly because it saves them time. So the determining factor here is the accessibility of the knowledge. Um, several aspects. Does the desired knowledge even exist? Do political actors know what sources to turn to? How capable are they of sorting through the knowledge they find, etc.? And, of course, there's a link uh, because the accessibility of knowledge results in part from the, the knowledge, uh, the, the sharing strategies that have been used in the past at some point. So here is a series of quotations illustrating situations faced by political actors when seeking knowledge. Uh, the first one reminds us that they do not always have subscription access to journals, and that was this is about Canadian health ministries, so even there it might be a problem. Um, second and third quotation, uh, political actors often suffer from information overload, and still they can also face difficulties in locating sources of knowledge. First, the fourth uh, quotation is a suggestion that researchers could introduce themselves to policymakers. And the fifth quotation here, a bit more positive, it highlights the, that the ability to sort through information can be acquired. The question for reflection here, uh, what do you do to make knowledge more accessible to political actors? And the examples below, well, they just mirror the issues that I've just mentioned. So the third point of entry is about situations involving collaboration between scientific and political actors. So they are represented by the orange box that encompasses all the initial steps in the process. And these situations involve sustained and repeated contact between actors. So we are not talking here about one-off knowledge sharing activities, but about situations in which knowledge sharing happens more or less automatically. But really, more or less. So please take a few seconds to read the two quotations here and answer the question, which of these two looks more conducive to knowledge sharing? I can see polls coming in. I'll let more time for that. Okay, so uh, a vast majority of you, no surprise, really considers that th there is probably more openness in the first uh, of the situations that is described here. So the, I'll switch to the question for reflection here. It's about uh, your, your own collaborations with political actors and if they have proven conducive to knowledge sharing and why, of course. So, I've presented the three points of entry into the process. Uh, are there any questions so far? Please let me know through the, the chat box. OK, 
Okay, I can see that uh, Paul is typing. Okay, I'll just leave a few more seconds. Okay, Paul is asking a very wide question. What avenues could be used to remain effective? Uh, Paul, is it about remaining effective in time, over time? Or is it about what uh, strategies are more effective than others? Could you specify, please? I can see that other people are typing as well. So, okay. Mm. Okay, so I'll start with the easy one by Anne uh, the, about the change of personal. Um, I will give a partial answer to that uh, later on about the contact with uh, policy advisors. Uh, it will be a, a partial answer, of a partial answer, of course. Um, but th there is an avenue there. Um, Noah, when the culture promotes one avenue but not the others, what kind of strategies can be used to promote the other entry points? Um, I I understand your point about the culture in general, but it's with knowledge sharing. It's always a question of adapting to the specific actor you wish to address. So I've made, of course, it's a I'm giving a broad overview today. So I've talked about actors in general, but the questions for reflection that we propose are meant to uh, lead you to analyze the specific position of the person or group of persons you are trying to address. And among this group, uh, they may have different needs, different expectations. Uh, some channels may function better with some of them and other channels with other of them. So it's really about analyzing the situation at hand. And it's why uh, I presented actually the questions for reflection in the form of questions and not advice, because it's very difficult uh, in knowledge sharing to give advice that is relevant for a wide range of situations. And well, yeah, Paul, I would say the same. Really, the, the effective channels for dissemin dissemination depend on your audience and depend on your audiences again. So it's really about tailoring um, the, the strategies you are using to meet the, the needs and, um, and customs of your audience. Yeah, and Jenny Green uh, puts an interesting comment here that uh, uh, there is a better reception when trust and relationships have been established with political figures. So thank you for that, Jenny. So I will move on. I realize that my answers are somewhat general, and it's because the way we address the topic today is very general. Um, in the next steps in the process, when we will go in greater depth on some uh, specific topics, um, we will be able to discuss nuances. And in each of your own situations, it's always all about nuances. So the, the key is really analyzing who you are talking to in which situation. So I hope the questions for reflection can lead you to that. But obviously, we will not solve that today. So I will go on. If you have further questions, post them in the chat box, and we will address these uh, later on. So, if all has gone well to this point, uh, political actors have either received or located scientific knowledge. So, wonderful. Problem solved. Well, not really, obviously. So, what happens next? 
Um, next is the uptake of knowledge by political actors. And actually, I should say by a political actor or political actors individually, because here we are talking about a part of the process that is necessarily individual. So uptake is about whether the political actor actually decides to consider the scientific knowledge at hand, that is, reading it or listening carefully, then whether this actor decides to engage in further reflection, and then maybe to plan to use this knowledge. Of course, none of these steps ensures the occurrence of the next one, so the process may stop really at any stage. We, as uh, knowledge producers or conveyors, we obviously have no control over this process, but with a bit of foresight, we may foster certain outcomes. And so I'm going to ask for your input here again. Uh, what factors do you think may support knowledge uptake by political actors? And Jenny actually suggested one a few minutes, minutes ago. So several of you are typing. Okay, so long-term connection, patience. Yeah, thanks for this piece of advice, Deborah. Timing, yeah, very important. Matching with political necessities, absolutely. And highlighting gaps, yeah. So the, the knowledge that would interest policymakers, but that does not exist yet. Relevance, not using knowledge brokers, yeah. An actor's interest and or passion on the issue, relationships again, that was mentioned, yeah. Framing the impact of the literature in terms of their concerns of interest, fit with their agenda, using their language, yeah, thanks for that, Sarah, so adapting oneself. Also, yeah, uh, a comment by Brent, using public pressure and the media. Ensuring the knowledge you share is relevant and practical, tailored to specific contexts, personal relevance, user-friendly format, ease of access. Okay, well, thanks for all that. You are very good. So I will now sketch out what the literature tells us about determining factors, and you will see that it totally resonates with the ideas you've just shared. I think you've mentioned all of them, so We'll just complement that with um, telling quotations. So what happens first uh, to determine whether a body of knowledge is worthy of consideration? Political actors carry out a preliminary sort. So it is based first on how they judge the producers or conveyors of knowledge. And in this quotation, you can see one aspect of this. Um, the, the reputation of the organization that produced the knowledge. In this case, really, we have big names, the WHO, the CDC, Harvard Medical School, and this political actor saying that, yes, if it comes from them, it increases the probability that the study will be looked at. The second point, and again, you mentioned that, um, political actors also assess to what extent to what extent the knowledge meets their needs. Um, I have identified three aspects that are salient in this regard. The first one with being with how the knowledge resonates with the political actor's current agenda. So you express this. It also uh, appears clearly and bluntly in this quotation. Um, if the, le the legislature isn't even considering a topic at that time, it just might not be the right time to present a study on that topic.
And third point, some of you mentioned it as well, it's quite well known. The knowledge must be in a format that political actors judge easy to digest. Okay, I can see that we have problems with sound again. Is it... Okay, okay, I'll go on. Um, so, uh, what happens after first consideration of the knowledge? Political actors compare it once again with their needs to decide whether it deserves further reflection. And in addition, another factor at play here is whether they perceive they understand this piece of scientific knowledge. So the quotation here is quite telling. Uh, there were efforts, but not sufficient, apparently. A senator telling um, the charts they, pu they put up there had all these little numbers to help us. Some of them were black and some of them were red, but we did not have a clue what this was about. Uh, obviously, if not the, the knowledge at hand is not understood, uh, the political actor may give up. Next, uh, what mediates between political actors' reflection and their intention to use the knowledge? Well, the perception that the knowledge meets needs is a determining factor again, but this time political actors focus more on how the knowledge may tie into their objectives. And it's natural because they are beginning to envision a concrete use. So, this quotation reveals how Australian civil servants in that study pursued an objective of designing interventions, while politicians wanted to persuade stakeholders, and they respectively saw value in researchers to help them achieve their objectives. Also, we should be aware that at this stage, it is quite likely that political actors transform the scientific knowledge. And why might this happen? Well, first, they may misunderstand it. Second, uh, they synthesize it with their prior knowledge. The, the new knowledge never arrives in a vacuum, so there is this process of synthesis. And third, more or less consciously, uh, they may try to make it consistent with their objectives. Uh, Catherine Smith, who is quoted here, has produced very interesting work about this. She noticed uh, during a series of interviews with policymakers she made that when she asked policymakers about evidence, they usually responded by talking about ideas. And she highlights how once detached from a specific evidence base, ideas can be extremely malleable. So it should be no surprise that the ends to which the knowledge is put are not always in the direction that its producers intended. So, uh, the questions for reflection here. Um, first one about how the political actors you are addressing perceive you. Uh, you cannot do much about this, but still you may target uh, the actors who are more favorably inclined. Or another option would be to delegate knowledge sharing to partners who are better perceived. Uh, the second question is about how you make sure to be timely when sharing knowledge. And the third one is about analyzing the positions of the actors you wish to address. First, to make sure that you design messages that they can understand. And first, to avoid involuntary distortions and also because you need to analyze their positions in order to frame your messages. And that's the point of the fourth question suggested here. Uh, of course, a limit here, important limit, is that framing should not obviously distort the knowledge that you are sharing. And fifth question here, uh, pretty obvious, uh, think of the formats that the political actors you are addressing prefer. So, if a political actor does intend to use a piece of knowledge, what happens then, concretely? Well, 
there is a shift here because we are moving from an individual process to a collective one. The policy development process is a collective one. Again, intention to use does not ensure that there will be actual use and even if the knowledge is used, it does not ensure that it will influence public policy development. Uh, of course, the ultimate aim of sharing public health knowledge is to improve the population health impact of public policies, but you understand that this impact, if it happens, will be very distant. And the more uh, we go further, the more other factors intervene in public policy development. First, science necess necessarily has a limited role and of course, all the other health determinants also are at play here. So I will present a short case in order to illustrate how things work in this part of the process. Uh, it's a fictitious but still plausible case, and I would like to thank my colleague uh, François Gagnon for helping me to design it. So let's imagine that Ms. B, a minority municipal councillor, read in the newspaper that, according to a recent study, lowering the speed limit to 30 km per hour reduces the number of injuries and deaths due to road collisions. And it happens that, at the same time, citizens in her district are asking for more road safety. So there could be one million possible scenarios from here, but let's imagine one. Um, Ms. B uh, has the intention to cite the study while requesting that the speed limit be lowered near parks in the municipality. But what actually happens uh, after deliberation in her political group, uh, they decide of another, to make another use of the data. So during a press conference, their spokesperson cites the study but focuses mainly on criticizing the current municipal administration for its track record in terms of collisions. And in the end, what comes out of this in terms of influencing public policy development? Well, the municipal council is dominated by the Myers party, but still takes the issue into account by mandating its infrastructure committee to study the possibility of lowering, lowering speed. So, in the end, the issue has been put on the agenda. Uh, we don't know what the decision will be in the future. We don't know when it will be made. So that's the outcome. A few elements that are interesting to note in this illustration. Uh, first, the, knowledge, the scientific knowledge was located through an intermediary, the newspaper. Second, it happened that there was a convergence between this knowledge and citizens' demands. And interesting to note, because if it was not the case, maybe Ms. B uh, would not have considered the study's results. Also, we do not see one policymaker, but several of them with varying powers, varying uses of the knowledge, and they reinterpret it. They reinterpret uh, the knowledge. They all do. The study was about um, speed limits in general, but Ms. B decided to focus on parks. Uh, her political groups mentioned the study, but in the end hijacked it for partisan purposes. And when the issue reached the Municipal Council, there was no more mention of the study. And by the way, it is perfectly plausible that none of these actors read the original study. So all they had was the information reflected in the newspaper. So again, a fictitious case, but that gives us uh, pretty plausible view of how uh, knowledge is managed in reality. What can we do as knowledge conveyors? We have no control of this process, but we may still seize new opportunities for knowledge sharing. In that case, for instance, when the opposition group made uh, its press, organized its press conference, it was a good time for experts of the subject to come out in the media. So, just an illustration, but I hope you can gain some uh, interesting insights from it. 
So, we've been through all of the parts of this figure. Uh, next, I will focus on the role of policy advisors. But before we move on, I'll, I will leave some time for questions, if you have some. So please type them in, in the chat box, please. Okay. I see no one for the moment. What I'll do, because we started late, a bit late because of the technical difficulties, I'll go on. If you have um, questions, I will address uh, these at the end of the webinar. So, policy advisors. They are often neglected, uh, however, they play a pivotal role. Um, this category includes political advisors as well as civil servants and because they work on the details of public policy development, they have an interest in data to feed this process. Their profile may also help. Uh, they may have past experience producing scientific knowledge or they may be attuned to it. And the other point, and this issue was raised by and to here, I think, uh, a moment ago, um, usually, well, policymakers, uh, of course, political advisors move with policymakers, but usually civil servants remain in office longer than policymakers. So creating, uh, establishing links with them can be a good option of working in a longer term. And these existing links with civil servants can also provide an entry point to a new administration after new policymakers have been elected or appointed. So, we refined the previous figure to distinguish the actions by advisors, indicated in blue, from the actions by policymakers, which are indicated in black. So, Advisors uh, act as consumers of knowledge. They either receive or locate knowledge and then process it. Afterwards, they may also decide to act as conveyors of knowledge to policymakers, and as represented by the arrows here, coming back to, so they actually engage in knowledge sharing strategies to convey knowledge to the policymakers they work for. Uh, this is exemplified here in the quotation uh, by a from a legislative staffer in the USA saying that he or she is the person um, explaining, uh, summarizing the content of reports for his or her boss. Advisors also act at the request of policymakers when the latter asks them to locate and or to process scientific knowledge. Again, with a quotation here, this time from a legislator saying, representing exactly the opposite uh, position. So when receive, receiving a report, uh, this person might give it to someone to say, tell us what it says. So. And so here, the question for reflection is, who do you address to draw attention to public health knowledge? Is that to policymakers and or their advisors? And actually, I'm interested, I'd like you to answer this one. So you also have the option, none of these answers, of course, um, if you do not target uh, political actors. So I let your answers come in. Very interesting. Among the people res responding, many, many, many of you target both. That's interesting. Okay. Thank you. So, we have the complete picture now, or nearly. And why nearly? Because, well, we may wonder whether policymakers are knowledge conveyors as well. Actually, they do convey knowledge in various situations. You can see an example in quotation one. Um, it reflects a situation of 
information exchange between peers, in this case legislators who cannot specialize on every issue, so they rely on each other's advice. But you also have uh, the second quotation here reminding us that even ministers do not have the final word and that they do have to try to convince others, for instance, the prime minister. So that said, um, at this stage, the, the scientific knowledge has circulated from hands to hands, has been transformed by several actors, as we have seen. So it is probably not uh, purely scientific in, in nature at this point anymore, and it's why we have not represented this situation in the figure. But still good to be aware of it. Um, a few words about uh, the, the specific case of healthy public policies. So here we are talking about sharing public health knowledge to influence the development of policies to be adopted in other sectors, but which may have a positive impact on health. So this could be a whole range of sectors. Um, it could be the transport sector, as in the case we presented earlier. It could be education, agri-food, environment, housing, etc., etc. All the policies from sectors that have an impact on the conditions in which people live. So knowledge uh, in, this situation, in these situations might be shared by public health researchers or professionals addressing actors from that other sector. Or it may be shared by policymakers from the health sector addressing their counterparts in other sectors. Um, as soon as you address actors from another sector, uh, well, these people have a different culture, so it raises additional challenges. They are less familiar with health issues, so there might be additional challenges in terms of understanding the knowledge. And also, they have their own knowledge bases. So the question is, do they even see public health knowledge as useful to them? The quotation here uh, by, from a, a transport planner is telling. It, well, this person acknowledges that a document from the National Institute for Clinical Experience is surely likely to influence people in the health sector rather than the transport sector. But on the other hand, this person highlights the fact that this uh, knowledge from the health sector could be interesting if it can be used as a mechanism to lever support of the health sector in a partnership between the two sectors. So, and that's what the, the questions for reflection are aimed at here. Once again, understanding the other's point of view is key to sharing knowledge effectively. So, a few take-home messages, or I would say a recap of the distinctive challenges faced when sharing knowledge in policymaking contexts. Intermedi intermediaries play an important role, particularly policy advisors, the media, NGOs. Second point, you usually don't face one policymaker, but one policymaker, but several. Also remember that when addressing actors from other sectors, you address people from other cultures, so think of their positions. And well, what we can see is that uh, the scientific knowledge is traveling through several circuits, so outcomes will necessarily be distant if they ever arrive at all. And all this happens in a democratic process, so however frustrating it may seem, it's normal that science does not dictate decisions. Still, it can contribute, and it's why we keep sharing knowledge and try to do it more effectively. So a few words about the project to conclude. Um, you have this available resource on our website, covering the content of today's webinar, and it includes the questions for reflection that I have presented. 
Uh, next steps will be um, publication of a methodological document early in the fall. It will also include a mapping of the 92 documents we have included in our literature review. And next, we will publish a series of topic-specific documents. It will be they, this will explore uh, topics emerging from the empirical data. So you have a few examples of the topics we may address here. We will also strive to identify potential specificities under each topic. So um, differences by country, by level of government, etc. And the first one of these documents uh, should be published next spring. We also wish to open a dialogue with you, uh, the colleagues who share knowledge or study the process. Um, so, well, to let you know about next activities in the process, but also uh, to consult you occasionally. Uh, why? Because, well, the literature leaves gray areas and also because each context has its particularities. So your input would be very valued. These would be light forms of consultation. So if you wish to join this dialogue, I invite you to subscribe to our mailing list. And we still have uh, a moment for questions. So please just type your questions in the chat box. And I will be ha happy to answer these. So we have several colleagues typing. Okay, Rosanna. <laughs> yeah, okay, interesting, Rosanna. And uh, Rosanna is um, saying that the, the document about the line between advocacy and knowledge sharing would be fascinating. Yeah, I agree with you. Actually, if you have um, subjects that interest you more than others, because there are, we will have to prioritize, obviously. So just let us know. And maybe we will, we may actually organize um, a consultation um, to hear you in your input about priority priori ah it's getting difficult sorry about prioritizing um, the topics we could address first and again it will all be based really on empirical data arising from the literature from studies that evaluated uh, hands-on experiences of um, knowledge sharing uh, studies that explore the point of view of policymakers, advisors, public health factors. So it will really be based on empirical data. But as I said, we will be interested also in presenting you this content arising from the literature so that you react, so that you, you tell us if this resonates with your experience as public health factors in a Canadian context. So that will be our aim. I would suggest if you have, um, if you wish to um, ask questions until we close this webinar, just to let us know now in the chat box, like saying yes or me or whatever. So we can keep the lines open until you formulate your questions. I will. My my email address is also uh, here in the PowerPoint, so you can also send me your question afterwards. I know it can take some time to formulate questions after receiving the new content, so really feel free to contact me. And meanwhile, I will also mention that uh, Maud just posted the the link to the evaluation form, so please. Fill, fill the evaluation form, it helps us to, to improve our webinars. Okay, I can see that Scott is typing.
Okay, I can see no more questions or persons wishing to ask questions. So, okay, Scott. Does the literature include any examples of collaboration between researchers and police actors that go beyond the reception stage? Hmm. Um, okay, I will give a half answer, Scott, because um, I did a preliminary analysis of the literature, but the whole answer will come out when we produce a document specifically on this. But yeah, th there's a whole part of empirical data um, about what, for instance, policymakers expect from researchers. So do they wish them to uh, provide recommendations or do they consider researchers just have to um, to provide them with the knowledge and it's up to policymakers to draw recommendations. And really the, the positions in this regard vary. So I, I'm actually, um, I, I will be very inter interested to try to analyze why. Is it depending on the country? Is it depending on the type of policymaker? Maybe whether in the executive or legislative branch. So yeah, I can tell you that the literature addresses somehow your question, but really I, I will be able to provide a more sophisticated, sophisticated answer after I go through a, an in-depth analysis. Does it answer your question at this point? Okay. Okay, so I feel there are no more questions for now, so we will close the lines, but really feel free to contact me later on with more questions and don't forget to fill the evaluation form. Thank you.